Good afternoon, it's Tuesday the 9th of June 2015, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host this afternoon, Brian Gerrish. With me in the studio behind the technical desk is Nick Green. And uh, we're delighted to say that we've got former policeman John Hurst joining us on video link. And uh, fingers crossed, technology will work today. But before we uh, bring in uh, John, let's uh, just comment on the weather here in Plymouth, beautiful summer's day, albeit with a bit of a uh, cool wind, but we've got blue sky, uh, light fluffy clouds, unlike the rest of the country or other places. Manchester is a bit cool and Glasgow's cloudy. So if you're suffering with a lack of sun, stay with us for the uh, delights of UK Column News. Uh, well, John, understand you're out and about. Can you uh, hear me okay? I can, yes. Uh, I, I've stopped off at a friend's house uh, uh, to uh, to uh, uh, keep you up to date. Uh, I would have been at the uh, Royal Courts of Justice today with Linda Lewis, but unfortunately, she's having problems getting getting some financial information from the from uh, the DHSS. Uh, the, the, the issue is when you when you lodge a case at the uh, at the High Court and ask for fee remission, it's called. Um, you have to prove your income within five days; uh, otherwise, they stop the case. So, um, Kevin and Linda are working on that, and we may have another trip to London later in the week. Right, OK. Well, excellent. Thank you for joining us. And we get, we're obviously going to um, be talking to you very shortly about the work that you're doing with the British Constitution Group in the courts. And I know that you've got some interesting comment on uh, what's going on in the black, what's going on in the background, which could affect the way uh, the police operate. And on the, <clears throat> on the happy subject to the boys in blue, um, we just bring this slide on screen because we find it utterly fascinating at the moment uh, that we've got a metropolitan police who seem incapable of investigating anybody connected with uh, child abuse if they are indeed themselves connected with the establishment or they are uh, politicians or they're connected with the political circles in Westminster. Uh, the Mirror, as we showed yesterday, was getting pretty blunt and saying uh, that um, there were questions which Metropolitan Chief Sir Bernard Hogan Howe needed to answer. Police and the pedo MP cover-up. Uh, then we pointed out that uh, the BBC were now in bed with the Met Police in order to uh, uh, provide a... Um, a glowing report on the uh, performance of the Met Police. Sir Bernard Hogan Howe out on the streets himself arresting criminals. Uh, great work by the BBC. £3.65 billion pounds of our money uh, not to investigate what's really going on in Westminster and politics, but to help promote the career of uh, Sir Bernard Hogan Howe. And then we've had the recent remarkable news that... Um, Dame Eilish Angelini, formerly uh, Procurator Fiscal in Scotland, uh, was the lady used by the Met and the Crown Prosecution Service uh, to write them a report on their performance with regard to rape and uh, rape victims. And uh, we'd just like to show here that our front page uh, from back in 2012, I think this was uh, showing, um, as she was then, Procurator Fiscal, and um, we'd like to thank our researcher for an excellent article showing connections with Dame Eilish Angelini and changes in the law in Scotland, which certainly appeared to make it seem that uh, uh, restrictions on men having sex with young boys or teenagers at least was being relaxed thanks to the uh, work of this, uh, this lady. So we've simply left it with a question mark and an exclamation mark in the middle of the screen. But we think there's some uh, really dirty dealings going on in the Met Police. And of course, we see no progress on, being, on bringing um, political high-level establishment figures to book for child abuse. John, what's your take on uh, what's happening with the Met at the moment? Well, I'm surprised to hear the Commissioner's been arresting people. Does it mean literally he's arrested somebody? Oh, yes, indeed. Um, while the BBC were present, presumably by an extraordinary coincidence, he happened to be out on the streets and the BBC was there on the spot to film uh, Sir Bernard Hogan Howe making an arrest himself. So the BBC said. And of course, Listen, it's, it's not unprecedented. Sir John Stevens did on a number of occasions, leapt out of his car and arrested people. It's a bit of a risk, though, because he's not a constable. He hasn't got a constable's power of arrest to arrest somebody by mistake. 
Um, so it's okay if it's a straight, straight, straight matter, but uh, he's only a private citizen as far as rest concerned, which is a bit unfortunate because it then takes us on to the, uh, the, uh, the recent act of parliament I've been researching. Can I, can I talk to you about that briefly? Of course. This is a very important matter which uh, we'd love people to learn more about. Okay, well, um, fire up your, uh, your, your web browser, um, legislation.gov.uk, uh, and go to the Criminal Justice and Courts Act 2015. Criminal Justice and Courts Act 2015, look at section 26, and I'll just give you, read the first, uh, first paragraph. And it's about corrupt and other improper exercise of police powers and privileges. Section 1, a police constable, listed in section 3, commits an offence if he or she exercises the powers and privileges of the constable improperly and knows or ought to have known that the exercise is improper. So exercise the powers improperly and knows or ought to know. So this brings training. I, I, I used to be a, a trainer uh, to, to some degree. Uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, physical training, like handcuffs and buttons and that, that sort of thing, uh, 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 six months refresher, uh, the trainer took the names of the people who did the course, watched them do it, and then and then signed them off uh, uh, on a sheet with signatures. So in the event of a council being accused of not knowing how to use handcuffs, the trainer could say, well, on, on this day I taught him. So on, on the civil standards of proof, he was properly trained. Now, that that, that seems to not been applied to um, law books and that sort of thing, but uh, it ought to now. Those who ought to know that the exercise is improper. Um, section 2, a police constable guilty of this offence under this section is liable on conviction to indictment imprisonment for a term not exceeding 14 years or a fine or both so it's quite major 14 years is the greatest penalty uh, uh, short greatest mandatory penalty short of um, short of life um, and the, the constables referred to are a constable of a police force in England and Wales so unfortunately it doesn't apply to the commissioner but there we are but it does apply to people further down the food chain um, now um, when a new act of parliament comes out there are three sources of information about uh, 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 what, what, what Parliament intended. Well, the first is the Act of Parliament itself. The second is the guidance notes, which are um, uh, accessible from the legislation.gov.uk web, website. Um, and the third, third, third will be any, any material published by the Home Office about it. So let's have a look and see what the Home Office has got to say about this. Um, the purpose of this legislation, this option will introduce a new offence aimed at the corrupt use of the powers and privileges of police officers, for which only a criminal penalty is appropriate. It will also cover cases where an officer fails to act for corrupt reasons, for example, where he knows that a suspect did not commit a particular crime but conceals that knowledge because of a corrupt relationship with the person, or where an officer threatens to act or not act for corrupt reasons. Well, um, child, child molesting springs to mind immediately, doesn't it? Um, uh, they've got a problem. Now, I, I, uh, uh, I met a gentleman who lives down, down your way. Uh, I met him on Skype the other day, Brian, uh, whose name escapes me, but he's an ex-MOD ex policeman and he comes to, you, to your... Um, to your sessions, uh, and he's he's wheelchair bound. Does that ring a bell? It does indeed. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, he's he's uh, he's approached a number of serving policemen and uh, about this, and he's shown them it, and they've told him that, that no training's been given, which is an immediate breach of this act, isn't it? <laughs> so 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 two of them, in fact, were so so concerned, they they immediately went back to the police station to, to go go and try and find out because um, there's a tremendous amount of liability there. Let me just read that, read that to you again. We're talking about 14 months, 14 years imprisonment, exercise the powers and privileges of counsel improperly, and knows or ought to know that the exercise is improper. So let's, let's, for example, we say to a policeman, uh, do you know about the Bill of Rights? And he says, no. Guilty. Um, you see where I'm coming from? I see, absolutely. And of, of course, um, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but your research into this area has started because we can see that uh, uh, our government bodies who should be standing up to make sure people are performing correctly and not doing their job. We know there's utter corruption, fraud and corruption in the courts, so the courts are not doing their job. And the point is here that where the police uh, have been failing to do their job, we've now got the opportunity to bring private prosecutions against all these individuals, whether, whether they're local authority officers or they're police uh, there's now a route to actually go for these individuals in person. Um, but of course, if if we, the wider body of the public, do this, we've got to be fair to these organisations. We've got to be reasonable. And I think what you're saying is we need to alert them of what the rules are, because if they don't understand the rules in the first place, that's a problem. So we educate them as to what their their rights and obligations are. But once they know... Um, if they still uh, fall short of what the law requires, then in comes the private prosecution. Is that a rough summary? Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's an excellent summary, Brian. Um, um, 
the police federation seems to be remiss on uh, on, on this one. Uh, uh, at the very least, they should have put, put out some training material. Um, they used to when something came along as important as this, but uh, uh, subject, my, my initial research implies they haven't. Uh, on the subject of investigating policemen as well, there's a, there's a new strand, uh, and it's the Section 151 officer, so I refer you to my previous programmes and, uh, and comments and the two articles. Um, uh, and the Section 151 officer is empowered to investigate unlawful acts that have happened or unlawful acts that are about to happen um, by members of um, police forces financed by a local authority. So you're Avon and Somerset, aren't you? So, so, uh, are you Devon and Cornwall? Devon and Cornwall. Yeah. So Devon, Devon and Cornwall, Cornwall, one by one officers employed by the council have got the duty to investigate unlawful acts uh, by by policemen and um, uh, prospective unlawful acts. Um, and 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 the, the perspective that the one five one officer applies is: is it going to cost anybody money? Indeed, it's going to cost money, and of course it is because people are being sued, aren't they? Yes. So, so, so Linda Lewis is a good example, but um, so, so we've got some new strands to um, to um, uh, um, give constables that uh, they, they've now got an incentive, haven't they? Constables now have an incentive that they're in deep doo doo if they don't do the right thing, and they need to know what the right thing is. And you've heard me complaining about how police training is being dumbed down. Instead of proper law books, they now get um, uh, uh, cartoons uh, and, and distance learning packages, and nobody actually witnesses, witnesses them doing doing the training. Uh, and it's all got very slack. Well, it's a chance to get a grip. Um, John, excellent um, report there. And uh, the, the mention of cartoons is, is really good because in a minute we're going to come on and have a look at drama. Uh, drama and politics um, seem to be getting mixed up. And I have noticed that quite a lot of um, material, which is supposedly um, aimed at adults, is produced by the government, but it's full of cartoons. It's written in a very childish manner. Um, is this accidental? I don't think so. It's deliberate. So we'll, we'll come on to that in a few minutes. Without um, compromising the gentleman concerned, I, I put a post on Facebook this morning that uh, we had had a visit from uh, two gentlemen from the uh, police uh, a couple of days ago. You were present. I got the feeling that uh, we had two genuine constables with us. Uh, the subject was child abuse. Um, but it's quite clear that the moment you, you start to say, well, this is going on, the response from those uh, constables was, well, our own police force can't deal with that. So you see that the police are trying to say, well, we're not that constabulary, we can't deal with that. This is just the trick that the politicians pull when they say, well, you're not in my constituency, so I'm not interested in the crime. What's your response on this? How do we deal with this business that the police are, are trying to ignore crime by saying that their force can't deal with crime in other areas? Well, the person you were speaking to was a sergeant, was he? And one of the roles of a sergeant is to, is to manage the workload, shall we say. Um, uh, and uh, um, sergeants are entitled to uh, make decisions about what, what's investigating what isn't. Um, on the subject of waking them up, uh, you recall I said to them, uh, this, this is, this is my, my, my take on what's happened. Um, go back to medieval times and uh, a village might tolerate a village idiot, but they wouldn't t tolerate a village paedophile. Uh, uh, and if anyone would try that sort, sort of thing, he'd be, he'd be chased out of the village by village with pitchforks and probably killed. Um, uh, in the Victorian period, they were more enlightened and uh, a person who was an incorrigible paedophile was known as a moral imbecile. Moral imbecile, and they were locked up for life and not allowed to breed. Um, uh, and then in the 1960s, uh, for whatever reason, they were let out. Now, my, 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 my theory is that is that um, paedophile, uh, sorry, psychopaths have already risen to the top of top, top of the food chain um, and, and maintained their position there. Um, they're about three percent of the population overall. So, paedophiles at the top, of the, sorry, psychopaths at the top of the food chain, uh, a long-standing inst institution. Um, uh, David Icke sort of takes them back to back to Babylon and and, uh, and Egypt and so on. Uh, uh, for whatever reason, in the 1960s, uh, it was decided that if a, if a person ca can't be cured, they they can't they shouldn't be kept in mental hospitals. So a lot of the people that were let out, and that would explain the uh, increase in, in 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 this sort of unpleasant behaviour. And the two the two policemen sort of nodded, didn't they? Um, and and that, that's the insight. Now to take take that away, and then and then you've got an explanation of what we see around us. Uh, this is very true. And uh, the thing that came across in our conversation is that uh, the two. Um 
policemen concerned were clearly listening to what we had to say about what was really going on in the country. And I think it's appropriate, I should say publicly, that uh, one of the things that we told the, the two policemen was uh, that uh, all of the research that we're doing, um, very dedicated groups researching the abuse of children, all come to the conclusion that it isn't just a question of a few paedophile gangs. What is actually going on is that the state institutions which say they are there to protect children are actually the means by which children are identified, procured, and then passed into the abuse rings. Uh, so that uh, was a fascinating conversation, but we, as we say, we we don't want to compromise the work of the officers concerned. Uh, the other uh, way, uh, if, if I had a bit more time, I, I would give an example of, the, of Peter Wrighton, the uh, the um, uh, member of Mrs. Thatcher's cabinet, uh, a so-called leading expert on childcare. Um, and as Kaz has pointed out, there are manuals about how childcare is done, and he's written them. And then he subsequently revealed to be a paedophile himself. Um, and those manuals should be uh, should be scrapped and rewritten. I don't know if they have. Perhaps Cas can uh, let us know. Uh, but that's the insight. A person that's been inside the system is concerned because children's homes uh, run on rules, and the rules are set will appear by people with this uh, hidden agenda. Uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, the other thing that um, clearly produced some uh, thought in in the two uh, police officers was when we mentioned the amounts of money that charities are able to. Um, uh, draw in through work with children and I think the one I quoted to him was a, hundred, a turnover of 198 million by the charity Action for Children. Well that's a, a great deal of money simply based on children. We'll come, we'll come on to this uh, in more detail in the coming days and weeks but uh, okay we'll leave it there. Um, let's move on to um, what's happening in the world. And uh, President Obama has been speaking out very strongly, of course, blaming the Russians for everything bad that's happening in the world. And he's made this extraordinary uh, statement. He said that um, it's Putin who's causing all the trouble at the moment because he's attempting to uh, revive the glories of the Soviet empire. Uh, so Vladimir Putin has been accused of flexing Russia's military muscle in a chilling attempt to revive the Soviet empire. Well, what a classic statement by uh, President Obama. Um, let's just have a look at some of the news reports. This is from The Independent. Obviously, British and US troops parade 300 yards from the Russian border in a show of Western unity. Uh, OK, this is from Russia today, but what they were reporting was uh, accurate, factually correct. Uh, another intrusion of NATO warships into the Black Sea. And, uh, well, let's bring in the other half of the, uh, of the, uh, the corrupt US-UK uh, uh, US alliance, so David Cameron. And here he was um, saying that we should be sending troops to Ukraine and he says, well, you know, if we appease Putin, it's just like appe uh, appeasing Hitler. So um, the only thing that really co is coming out of the mouths of the president at the moment appears to be propaganda and lies. So the military manoeuvring and intimidation clearly coming from the West. Uh, well, what does he say publicly? Well, he's going to he's going to blame it or attempt to blame it on the Russians. And yes, I do sit here thinking with the background I have as an ex-military man, I never thought I'd be saying this, but we're interested in the truth. And it's quite clear to us at the moment that uh, there's a whole pack of lies coming out of the common purpose between uh, Barack Obama and uh, David Cameron. Well, it gets worse, of course, because if we look at the news reports, uh, as David Cameron says, Russia is a growing and a growing threat. Uh, what is David Cameron doing? He's cutting and cutting the British military. And of course, this is sending some of the papers into utter confusion. Well, we're not confused. Let's have a little look about what's really happening here. So the Daily Mail has got this extraordinary uh, picture. Uh, have you got that one, Nick, please? There we go. And uh, we've got Max Hastings, a so respected uh, journalist, saying the madness of reducing our armed forces to ferry to a ferry service for migrants. And there's a picture of uh, 
a whole lot of migrants coming on board a warship uh, and the captain saying quite rightly terrible humanitarian disaster but we've been able to save uh, some of them uh, just point out what a fascinating state of affairs that when one human being meets another in 2015 they have to wear rubber gloves and a uh, and a uh, face mask but we'll leave that to a side let's have a look at this we've got um well we think it's the madness and lies of david cameron the first lie is there is no money and this is the basis for the defense cuts it's there for the cuts in the nhs education roads um any form of benefits according to cameron there's no money uh, the second lie is we must therefore have massive cuts. No, we don't. But the real madness, uh, we're going to award uh, to Max Hastings because he actually seems to believe this nonsense. And if we look at the article in a bit more detail, this is some of the things that he said. But we can ask hard questions of a government that simultaneously maintains a bloated foreign aid budget deploys a warship close to the Libyan shore to assist migrants and cuts the defence budget beyond the bone. So this man is confused and it goes on. Meanwhile, in the last parliament, David Cameron presided over the passage of a law ring fencing spending on foreign aid, currently 12 billion. And we might as well do this bit. David Cameron, uh, Cameron should be with an A, of course, uses language carelessly when talking of foreign threats calling the menace posed by Western African jihadists existential and that of IS mortal, both of which propos propositions are nonsense. He said that the only alternative to authorising airstrikes against IS was to walk on by. And then he seemed content that Britain proved capable of deploying just four old RAF, RAF tornadoes to fulfil its share of the mission. So... He is utterly lost in the lies of David Cameron that there is no money. He's not the only one. Uh, let's have a look at this. So we come in at a different angle. Well, it's GPs, but essentially it's the same thing. We've got no money. We can't run the doctor's surgeries. So there's got to be cuts. And what is that doing? Increasing background. Now, I'm going to bring um, John in in just a second. But uh, what else have we got? Well, here was the Bureau of Investigative Journalism uh, warning about um, David Cameron and his cohorts mixing uh, with property moguls and guests worth 22 billion at a Tory fundraising. And the article said that there were doorstep lenders, property moguls, controversial bankers were among these 22 billion wealth guests at a Tories black tie dinner. Um, no suggestion that guests discussed either policy or their bis business interests. No suggestion. A spokesperson for the Tory party said all donations to the Conservative Party are declared and published. And they then went on to say any suggestion that policy is influenced by donations is malicious and defamatory and will be treated as such. So um, here we are. We have David Cameron who can mix with people worth 22 billion behind closed doors. No impropriety. Um, any suggestion of such is outrageous. Well, of course, we're making that very suggestion today. Um, John, it's pretty in your face what's going on at the moment. The public's being told a pack of lies. Well, the, the good news is, is the public are waking up, I, was, I suspect. Um, um, the, the, I used to read them out regularly. Obviously, I, I was brainwashed at the time. But uh, um, um, if you read the comments section rather than the article, you'll find people are scotching that, I'm sure. So, 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 so um, there, is, there is suggestion if you read the comments section, you, you, get, you get public opinion. And if you read the paper, you get propaganda. So perhaps things are better than, better than you might think. Brilliant. Thank you for that. We'll actually have a little look at that after the programme. Mm -hmm. Well, where does the, no the nonsense come from? Let's remember that we've got Barack Obama and David Cameron warning that Russia is about to create World War, War III. Is David Cameron preparing the defences of the uh, country? Are we building nuclear shelters? Are we building up our armed forces to defend the island? Well, of course, we're not. We're doing the opposite. Something's wrong. 
Um, what sort of policy maker would David Cameron use? Uh, well, policy, of course, comes across in speeches. Let's have a look at this young lady. Um, so, how the Tories can shed their nasty image by David Cameron's speechwriter who wants to axe the bedroom tax and uh, ban knighthoods for tax dodgers. Uh, she says, uh, this is Claire Foges, uh, urges Cameron to paint words one nation in primary colours. Um, they've still not shaken off the impression it is the party of the rich. And she or or urges the government to uh, provoke rows with web firms and supermarkets. And it says here very clearly she helped write Cameron's one nation victory speech after the election. Well, where does this young lady get all of her uh, political acumen? Well, as you might suspect, from ice cream sales. And she worked selling ice cream before joining Mr Cameron's team in 2008. And she says, based on her experience selling ice cream, that the perception of the Tories as the party of the rich is wounding. So that was all complete nonsense about David Cameron meeting with his £22 billion chums uh, and they were influencing policy. Uh, that is simply the sort of malicious gossip you get around ice cream vans. And she says the One Nation dream is not just about a change in individual circumstances, but a change in the na national mood, about people really feeling we're all in this together. To achieve this, Conservatives need to get better at political drama. Well, let's bring in a little friend. Here he is, David Cameron. Uh, he can't write <coughs> speeches himself. I'm sorry, I'm having difficulty keeping a straight face here. The British Prime Minister is unable to write his own speeches. He needs to use an ice cream seller to do it. And the ice cream seller says that we need more drama in order to tell people in this country what is really going on. She also says, in a highly demeaning way, that, of course, the British public can only really deal with simple stories. Am I making this up? Well, of course not. So let's follow through on what is real, what is <coughs> real in politics and what is drama. Excuse me. Uh, have a look at this. We're going to bring you back to the report yesterday. And, of course, we were pointing out that the Met Police uh, were bigging themselves up by producing what we called a spaghetti western with the BBC. Uh, there's the big man, Sir Bernard Hogan Howe. Uh, we said that the BBC was cleverly detracting from child abuse by uh, focusing on Mark Duggan. But this is the key bit. The BBC um, reporter running this, or director, Abigail Priddle, uh, says that basically uh, we need to get more drama uh, back into um, our reports. So we've got uh, ice cream sellers talking about drama. We've got BBC talking about drama. And then we also reported this, the Jimmy Savile play. And we just remind you as to what we highlighted uh, because we had, um, uh, we had the author of the play here saying that sometimes drama can answer the really important questions more effectively. So in the mainstream news, we are seeing a blurring of what is real, what's truth, and what is coming in, which is pure fiction, it's drama. Or as you've said, uh, John, we're now starting to see police officers being trained, in inverted commas, uh, by the use of uh, cartoons. This is not accidental policy, is it? Well, it's, it's a necessary consequence of lowered recruiting standards, uh, I, I would say. Um, uh, um, I, I'm not privy to what the civil uh, civil service training materials are like, but cer certainly it's a police issue. Um, and um, we, we now have an opportunity, the Courts Act 2015, to, uh, to hold the blighters to account because uh, ignorance is no excuse. Indeed. Well, where, where is the training agenda coming from? We're going to point a finger at change agents where do change agents get their money from? Well, they get their money from the uh, corrupt banking cartel, which is pumping money out to their boys. Uh, so we could list off all of the change agents. Of course, we pointed out the political charity Common Purpose. We've got Roundtree Foundation, Council for Foreign Re Relations, Claw Foundations. It goes on and on. Where does the money come from? 
Well, let's remind ourselves of this man, George Soros. And uh, if you check out his own websites, uh, he's admitting to a mere $1.9 billion, uh, which he is putting in in order to promote change, um, sells change agents in countries worldwide. But of course, the UK and the USA have particularly been attacked by this very devious, subversive work and the British Civil Service now totally subverted by common purpose change training. So I think we get an idea of where it's coming from. And I just wanted to highlight that uh, yesterday, uh, Mike Robinson um, put this up on screen, a wonderful book, US Money versus Corporation Currency by Alfred Owen Crozier. And this was warning about the formation of the Federal Reserve Bank and he was saying, if this happens, these criminals are going to be in control of the money supply. They're going to be in control of nations and politicians. But what we would like to keep pushing to people is the solution is so simple. It is the Bradbury Pound. It's the British government's nation states issuing their own currency as credit because it's at a stroke this cuts out the fraudulent formation of money from nothing, which is what is going on by the International Bank of Settlements, uh, the European Central Bank, the Federal Reserve. This is all utter fraud. And of course, we know that mortgages are not uh, given as sums loaned, but uh, what is actually happening is people are being advanced credit, uh, which, is, which is also fraud. John. Well, as far as Soros is concerned, he's been caught out on a couple of occasions. One, one is the um, uh, Ferguson, the American town where there was, there was an unfortunate death of a, a black man at the hands of the police. Um, he paid for uh, demonstrators to, to go onto the streets. And, 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 and there was an unfortunate incident where uh, the, they, the demonstrators didn't get paid. So they, they, they took their demonstration from the police line to the office that had been rented and besieged that, asking for their money, which was a bit of a giveaway. Um, and a similar thing happened in Ukraine. One of the uh, one of the hidden agendas there is that huge amounts of money was used in, in the Ukraine after the uh, uh, disorder was started. But it's been revealed that it was it was it was um, counterfeit money. So uh, so so the the reason well, is believed that one of the reasons why the uh, the trouble in Ukraine has come to a halt is that the uh, the mercenaries have realised they've been had, <laughs> and they're probably besieging the office that gave them the duff money. Mm. Well, the truth is coming to the surface. We've just got to encourage people to um, get out there digging and shouting about it themselves. Uh, but love of money, the root of all evil, if we deal with the uh, sheer corruption over money and this myth of a national debt, this is completely irrelevant. The problem can be solved overnight by reissuance of the Bradbury Pound. If you're an NHS worker or you're suffering in a school with cuts or in, you're in the police or the military, all of this could be solved overnight by Bradbury pounds being issued for set um, strategic projects in the public interest. And we're going to continue to report that. Well, well got, sorry. A couple of, couple of comments on that. The two, two gentlemen from the police that visited us the other day, uh, as soon as I mentioned the Federation, they went, boo, hiss, yeah, we don't, they're, they're useless, didn't they? And of course, what they're referring to is that their contracts have been uh, dramatically reduced. One of them said, well, I might as well not have a contract if they can keep moving the goalposts. So that's a major source of discontent that we can address because contract law is common law and we want to hold the crown to the common law. Um, uh, uh, and um, um, it's just a question of spreading the word, as you say. As far as lawful money is concerned, again, the Section 151 officer comes into it because um, the Section 151's officer is to, is to advise the council about lawful and unlawful actions. Uh, and we, if we say it's lawful to, to apply to the Treasury for... Um, full funding on the basis of, uh, of, uh, of, of lawful money, bribery money, and he's not doing that. He's got a problem. And, he, and the problem is that we can see him now. We know what he's up to. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, what else is happening behind the scenes? Well, we're talking about the immense power of uh, international bankers in controlling our politicians. Uh, how do they do this? Well, one group that's clearly used is the, is the Bilderberg organisation, and uh, the list of attendees has now been uh, released. Let's just remind ourselves, back in 2013, um, uh, Tony Gosling, amongst others, but also the UK column reporting on the, that particular Bilderberg uh, meeting. And on the UK column website, there are a number of articles, including by Patrick Henningsen 
uh, he said Bilderberg 2013, the birth, the birth of a global tax system. Of course, none of this reported properly uh, by the uh, press in UK, press and media, certainly not reported by the BBC. I wonder why. Well, let's have a look. Um, this was, um, uh, this was uh, the, um, some of the key faces from a previous Bilderberg meeting. And um, what's happening here? Uh, let's look at the faces. We've got um, George Osborne. Uh, so no problems with um, chancellors mixing with international bankers uh, when the banks have got trouble. We've got David Cameron, of course. We've got Ken Clark, Peter Mandelson, Ed Balls. Ed Balls is actually uh, back in with this particular Bilderberg attendees list, even though uh, he's, uh, he's not operating in Parliament. And we said at the time, rather well, cynically, no conflicts of interest or dirty deals behind these closed doors. So British politicians mixing with bankers from firms which have been publicly identified as committing fraud. They are corrupt in their abuse of the uh, money supply. So all of that's going on. Um, Cameron is uh, happy to be involved. Uh, at the same time, Cameron is saying, well, um, I've been misinterpreted. Everybody in government has signed up to my plan set out in the Tory manifesto. Uh, so Cameron denying that he's been bullying his own MPs into backing him. And the reports were if people said they wanted to withdraw from Europe, he was simply going to get them to resign. Now, he says all this is a lie. But let's remember that it was the Tory whips and Tim Fortescue, Conservative Tory whip from 1970 to 73, is on BBC film footage saying that MPs came to the whips with problems such as little boys and the whips fixed it for them and after that they would do as the party asked them. Well, that of course is blackmail and this is why we, we the UK column, continually warning that uh, the child abuse, abuse issue is fundamental to understanding how our politicians are being controlled by utterly corrupt bankers. Well, bring in the BBC. Uh, the BBC would rather have us foca focusing on uh, Glastonbury. I'm sorry to say we're calling this bread and circuses. Um, they're not uh, reporting on the Bilderberg meeting. I wonder why. Well, amongst the Bilderberg guests, um, we found this gentleman, Marcus Agius. Of course, he was formerly Barclays boss and formerly top BBC executive, non-executive chairman. Um, he's now with a consulting group, but he's attending um, the Bilderberg meeting. And um, also from the BBC is Rona Fairhead, chairman HSBC, director, chair of the BBC Trust. And our comment is Barclays or HSBC, if you're in with the criminal banks, you're in with Bilderberg. So... Very quick one, if, you, uh, if you'd like on that, uh, John. Uh, the BBC is really the most outrageous organisation in, uh, in UK. Um, thank goodness for Russia today. OK, there's a little bit of um, spin put across from the Russian point of view, but at least uh, we're starting to see Russia today journalists getting amongst the corruption in UK and reporting it. BBC, just a state asset, or am I being hard? I approach things from a legal point of view. Uh, as, as I say, uh, Bob Lamas woke me up years ago and said, "Well, politics is politics, and legal we can we can hold the biases to account because you're, there's a body of law and they're not following it." So the the, the leading case on bias, in, in actual fact, is uh, is called Inray Pinochet. It's to do with General Pinochet, who came across the UK for medical treatment, having been a dictator in South America for many years, and Jack Straw wanted to prosecute him, and uh, so so it led to it led, led to him appearing in front of. Um, Lord Justice Hoffman, and Lord Justice Hoffman in the early life was a, um, a South African civil rights lawyer and a member of Amnesty International, and it was Amnesty International, in fact, that was the, the plaintiff in, in, in the Pinochet case. So mm -hmm. I've got the judgment in front of me. So Mr. Mr. If, if Mr. Cameron claims he's impartial, well, this is, this is what the courts have got to say about this. The fundamental principle is that man may not be a judge in his own cause. This principle is developed by the courts as two very similar but not identical implications. First, it may be applied literally, if a judge is in fact a part of litigation, that's out of order. 
And the second is, if his conduct gives rise to suspicion that he's not impartial, for example, because of his friendship with the party, that's a breach as well. So, so, so I, I would say Mr Cameron is acting unlawfully uh, and the Whips act unlawfully um, and it's time to hold them to account. We, we, we're developing the tools, aren't we? Indeed. And it's just a question of applying them or at least becoming a credible threat, threat so that they behave. Uh, they, they, they may behave because the thing that they most value is their position, isn't it? Uh, position, power, and yeah. Uh, yeah, all of the trappings that go with it. Yeah, that's right. Now, th th there is a saying that, 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 that um, I, I suggested you should be Prime Minister in the past, and you laughed, haven't you? But the, the main qualification for it is you don't want to be Prime Minister. <laughs> Uh, I, I think I'd utterly hate the job. I yes, could I could enjoy four days of clear, or let's say a week, yeah. seven days of clearing out um, the dead wood. That could be enjoyable. That's, that's but right. that, yes, after yes. that, I'd be prepared to hand finished, over. Yeah, that, that's that, that, that's right. Okay. Um, um, so let's let's look forward to a time when this happens. Uh, let's be let's be positive about it. Uh, the, as I say, as, as an exercise, look at the comment section on the mainstream newspaper, and you'll find there's people like us regularly okay. commenting, and they actually get through and they get published. Indeed, um, uh, which is which is very very pleasing. Um, I, I recall speaking to um, a mutual friend of ours, Soldier Mike and, and 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 Lance, about five years ago. They came to our little cottage in Wales and they sat down. And they said, eighteen months ago, we were sitting in our cottage in in Devon, and we were awake and we were looking around and seeing where everybody else is. So so so, so we're we're beyond that stage, aren't we? Well beyond it, John. Yeah. Let let me just uh, finish with um, a little more uh, kindness for the BBC. Uh, let's just remind ourselves of the type of people who've been in there controlling the BBC. Uh, here is um, uh, Lord Patton, Chairman of the Trustees. Uh, there he is up at the top. Uh, what sort of man is he? Well, he's a common purpose man. Sorry, that should have come up on screen. I don't know what's happened to that. I assure you he's common purpose. Then we've got Anthony Fry. Uh, well, here's dear old Anthony. And um, what sort of man is he? Well, he just happens to be a Rothschild banker. So no conflicts of interest there. This is independent British broadcasting at its best. Um, there they are. Go and have a look yourself. Um, whoever you look at, you will find interesting connections. Do the research yourself. Uh, so here, here he is, Chris Patton. Uh, he was the chair. Um, at the same time, we, we had uh, pointed out that the BBC had spent over 158000 on common purpose, and uh, we put up the documentation where the BBC was then making excuses as to why the public couldn't be told who'd been trained. What is the BBC really hiding? Well, it's something very, very dark, and we think very dangerous. Let's come back to media action. This is the BBC's political charity. This is the charity that helped to foment regime change in Syria. We now can see millions died. Uh, here's Juliet Harkin, former BBC Media Action Project Manager and a so-called expert on Syria. And she said, we, that's the BBC Media Action, worked in 2004 with individuals within the ministry that's in Syria, who wanted change and tried to get them to be the drivers of that. And she went on to say, you have an authoritarian regime and you find who the reformers are within that and you work with them. This is the BBC that has been riddled with paedophiles, has lied, has misappropriated public money. And these people are inside nation states working to destabilise them. And it is only the UK column that has reported on this. If you haven't read this article, you need to. BBC Media Action Subversion from Broadcasting House to Kazakhstan. Uh, quite incredible <coughs> what the BBC uh, admit in their own words. And, of course, it was uh, the BBC uh, that has clearly covered up child abuse and is clearly refusing to investigate and report on the child abusers in Westminster and the establishment. A final 20-second comment from you, John, if you'd like. Um, I, I'm minded to um, refer to the article you, you published on the BCG website about a, um, a, a terrorist trial, somebody who has been a terrorist in Syria, and it collapsed because uh, it became apparent from the evidence that the government were doing exactly, the British government were doing exactly the same thing as, as he was. Um, so eventually their internal contradictions will trip them up and, and it's our job to look, look, look for the opportunity and, and do it in a legal sense, I would suggest. Thank and, you. And politics will follow from that.
Thank you for that. And uh, a final reminder, we will st still keep reporting other cases. Melanie Shaw still sitting inside Sodexo profit-making prison in Peterborough. Uh, we know that she's been on a punishment regime. We suspect she's been back in solitary confinement. This is what the British government, David Cameron, Theresa May, Home Secretary, politicians are doing, a uh, child abuse survivor put back in prison to silence her. And I'll just uh, leave you with the thought that uh, the uh, policeman who visited us recently uh, totally unaware of this case and very surprised when we pointed out what had been done to Melanie uh, by Nottinghamshire police. So if you're watching this programme, you're a policeman, a policewoman, we need your help to clean up the fraud and corruption in Britain's police and, of course, bring child abusers to book, whether they're in the police or parliament. Uh, John, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, we're at the end of our time. A last comment, thank you very much uh, for people who've been sending us cards in support of uh, 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 John Harris's family. Thank you very much for that. And uh, we will be reporting um, tomorrow on Kevin Bull, uh, who's been a very brave campaigner, achieved a lot, including in the child abuse field. And he also died last week. Uh, but we'll, we will uh, have a short piece on Kevin tomorrow. So thanks very much for joining us. Don't sit at home worrying about what's going on. Get out there and talk to other people, make friends, spread the word. And above all, do not let Britain's politicians get away with the dirty work they're currently doing. Thanks for joining us. The sun's still shining. See you tomorrow. Bye bye.